Welcome. My name is Donna Bales, and I'm the founder of the Canadian Reg Tech Association. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, How to Strengthen the Model Development Lifecycle. For those of you who have not been following our activities over the past few years, artificial intelligence has been a key focus area, and we featured our members and our community in webinars, podcasts, and thought leadership papers. In May 2020, we published our first paper, Safeguarding AI Use Through Human-Centered Design. This initial paper uh, examined the risks introduced by artificial intelligence and AI systems and how they're being managed during the product uh, development life cycle. Earlier this year, we followed up on a second paper called Moving Beyond Principles, Addressing AI Operational Challenges. And here we brought in our practitioners and academics and technologists to share their experience and insight and current thinking and offer guidance on how to deploy AI and machine learning effectively and safely. As an organization, we also responded to OSFI's green paper, Developing Financial Resilience in the Digital World. Earlier this year, we held two closed door sessions focusing on, focusing on AI governance called the Road to Good Governance. The purpose of these sessions was to identify best practices and collective uh, approaches to strengthen AI governance and address AI data challenges and to look for collaboration opportunities. Some of these uh, areas will probably be discussed in today's session. And we look forward as an association to continuing the dialogue. I want to pass it over now to our moderator, Min Wu. Min is a Senior Manager of Risk Compliance and Analytics at Prativity in New York. Uh, he specialized in credit risk and market risk and machine learning risk management. He has multi-year experience in machine learning, model development and validation in the areas of credit and fraud analytics. He holds a PhD in mathematics from the University of Washington. Min, welcome. I'm going to pass it over to you now. Uh, thank you, Donna. Uh, so as many of you know, uh, artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning techniques have been increasingly reshape reshaping the ways financial institutions operate, invest, and provide services in a number of areas, such as fraud detections, financial crime monitoring, personalization of customer services using NLP and voice recognition, credit decision-making and cybersecurity. From the regulator's perspective, while they do recognize that AI has a potential to offer improved efficiencies, enhanced performance and cost reduction for financial institutions, they also pay great attention to the barriers or challenges facing financial institutions when developing, adopting and managing AI and its risks. Uh, as you may know, uh, in North America, regulators such as OSFI in Canada, Federal Reserve in the U.S. have been working dil diligently to enhance their model risk management guidance, uh, including E23 SR11-7. Uh, at the same time, the federal, the Canadian federal government introduced uh, recently uh, Bill 27 um, in June that includes a new privacy laws such as artificial intelligence and a data acts or AIDA. If this law passed, it will enact broad regulations in the development and use of artificial intelligence systems in the private sectors as well, uh, which would be entirely new in the Canadian context. So in such background, uh, before we get into the specific risks of AI and its mitigates, uh, I'd like to use the opportunity to ask each of the panelists here today to give your overview, overall view, point of view on the current applications of AI, the, regula the regulatory landscape on manage uh, model risk management related to the use of AI, as well as of your um, observations, if any, on any potential gaps in consistencies um, in compliance with applicable laws and regulations. Um, maybe we can go by alphabetically, uh, eight, uh, do, you know, I know you are expert in credit risk and machine learning AI models. Uh, what's your view on the, you know, current 
recent development of AI machine learning models and the uh, potential regulatory landscapes in the near future. Thank, thank you, Min. Um, so my, my name is Ade. Um, so, you know, I, I like to start this this way. I know that, um, you know, um, the use of the terms machine learning and artificial intelligence have been made popular in recent years, really um, because of the increase in the volume and the amount of data that, you know, um, financial institutions are now processing and the use of, you know, um, more efficient um, computational techniques. But notwithstanding, um, the, you know, the credit modeling area and really all of all of risk risk modeling has been doing machine learning for the longest time, even before my career. So if you think about the traditional um, types of algorithms like logistic regression, even linear regression, um, you know, all of the time, time series modeling, um, by definition, those are machine learning. So what I want to start by saying is that the use of machine learning um, in risk modeling is not new at all, right? Um, what, is, what is new is you know, like, like I was saying, because we now have way more data to process, we have computational capacities, you know, with, with, with large cloud, um, you know, cloud infrastructures and financial institutions, we can now explore um, more cutting edge um, algorithms. So, you know, I remember when I was, when I was at TD, we were exploring um, things like XGBoost, um, you know, and some, some other, um, you know, more, more um, modern techniques in the area of credit adjudication. So with the use of these new techniques now, which you know, compared to the traditional techniques, are a little bit um, you know, what you can call black, black box, there is now the need for you know, um, um, you know, a higher level of scrutiny when it comes to explainability, uh, when it comes to modelers, uh, you know, validators, uh, you know, financial institutions in general, understanding um, you know, how these techniques work. With traditional approaches like logistic regression and linear regression, those were linear models where you know you just have to worry about coefficients and everyone understands how they work, right? But with this more um, cutting edge um, uh, or modern approaches, um, you know there 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 now needs to be um, you know a higher level of scrutiny. Um, also, when it comes to the users of the models, you know the the business who don't understand machine learning and modeling, um, how can you make sure that they still understand how the risk drivers in the models? Um, impact their decisions. Um, and then we can also talk about, you know, various things like uh, monitoring for data drift and all that, but, I, but I'll leave other uh, members of the panel to, to talk about that. But yes, one, one, one thing I'm really happy that um, OSFI is focusing on in the, in the E23 revisions is the focus on explainability and, you know, heightened transparency when it comes to the use of these modern machine learning algorithms in risk modeling. Thank you, Eddie. Um, thank you very much. Now we turn to uh, Adia Enni. Uh, Adia Enni is the Director of Data Science in the Advanced Analytics and Artificial Intelligence at CIBC. Uh, so Adia, um, can we ask you uh, your over, over, overall views uh, on this subject? Yeah, thanks, Min, and thanks, uh, Eddie. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm helping lead the uh, AI governance initiative uh, and program here at CIBC. Um, like Adi mentioned, uh, you know, uh, AI presents its own unique uh, risks uh, that uh, maybe traditional MRM model risk management uh, is not, um, you know, well equipped at the moment to um, to handle, especially with um, explainability, um, fairness. And also when, you know, models get, uh, you know, deployed at scale, right? Um, you can also have reliability concerns like uh, model drift. <clears throat> so yeah, we need to uh, complement the existing and enha enhance the existing MRM uh, frameworks to account for these uh, new set of, uh, new set of risks, right? And, um, and yeah, I think that's, that's where, you know, there's a gap at, at the moment and that's where, you know, organizations are, um, you know, thinking about how to best equip their first line and second lines of defense uh, with the um, with the capabilities and the processes to address these uh, unique sets of risks until, you know, regulations get passed and legislations get passed as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. 
Um, thank you, Adia. Um, now we tend to uh, Karthik uh, Raman Krishna. Um, Karthik is a co-founder and the chief business officer in Amelia AI, a company help institutions systematically validate their algorithm decision making uh, with uh, innovation technology. Uh, so Karthik, um, what's your view on this subject? Yeah, thanks for that. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll follow up from where Adi and Aditya were going, right? Um, I think um, machine learning is not new. We've been using models in financial services for the longest time, right? It's just with the, with the exposure uh, that the general consumer has now to models being used, there's a lot more attention to it, right? I mean, regulators have in the background been uh, working towards ensuring that these models are performing well, you know, with these existing SR117 and, and E23 and, and, and uh, the model validation practices that have been in place, uh, it's, it's, they've covered the most, uh, and this is where we're getting into material models, right? The other side of the coin to Adi's point, which is we're using more sophisticated models. We're also using models in the edges in more use cases than we have before. And so one of the issues we, we, we can tend to see and we, we tend to see is what is materiality anymore, right? So what is the cutoff for materiality? And this is a work done by the Monetary Authority of Singapore uh, a couple of years ago, where they started investigating marketing models. They're not material models. They're not regulated by E23 or SR117, but these models make decisions on who gets targeted for what products, credit lending products. So now are we being fair and are these models making the right decisions and who they present uh, these um, products to, right? Uh, and are we disadvantaging certain demographics or are we wrongfully targeting certain demographics who should not be having those products? So there's all of these questions that are coming up uh, in terms of where these models are applied now um, and how they're being used. So that's what, one aspect of it. Uh, the other point I would bring out is um, not just in terms of usage and proliferation of these models, but also um, what are the impacts of these models and how do we assess these impacts? That's the big question, right? So we're updating our existing regulations, let's say for explainability, great, right? We wanna look at data, awesome. We wanna make sure that they're accurate and performant, but there's a whole host of other metrics that, will, that needs to be completed to get a full picture of what a model is doing, right? So robustness, um, how do we ensure that the model is robust, not just from a generalized standpoint, but we know that the issues in models resides in sort of the, the edges and the, and, the, and the pinpoints of this. So the other issue is what are the metrics that we can agree upon? Um, typically regulations tend to generalize them and, and not be too specific. But when you apply them to a specific use case, you have to contextualize them. So there's this trade-off between specificity versus uh, generalizability and applicability of these regulations. So I think these are some of the challenges that we see um, clients uh, that we work with, our users that we work with, as well as you know uh, what we see uh, regulators struggling with as well, right? Like where do they go in the spectrum uh, across these three sort of uh, dimensions, I would say. Great. Thank you, uh, uh, Karthik. Uh, now, uh, lastly, uh, Tolga Kurt uh, is a uh, managing partner uh, of the company H3M Analytics, which specializes in AI-based compliance. Uh, Tolga, uh, so we'd like to ask you, you know, what's your point of view on the application of AI machine learning tools and you know, the potential regulatory changes in the near future? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think uh, we need to, look into this contextual way. What I mean by that is, you know, in the first dimension, we need to differentiate between <clears throat> what is machine learning and what is AI and how we regulate those, like how we differentiate AI. I mean, of course, the uh, some of the machine learning models, simplest ones have been in use for decades now, but when you kind of go into the system, where these machines suddenly start making decisions by themselves or they have abilities to tune themselves, modify themselves and react to changes 
in the market, in consumer behavior, then that's another context. So the regulation of those two should be different, I guess. The other thing is the regulation should also depend on where the AI is implemented. Now, in particular in North America, also in Europe, what we see is, you know, we need to regulate AI without saying, you know, AI applied to this field or that field. You know, one simple example is explainability, right? So one of the reasons that we are using AI is that it can do much more complex stuff than we do. So if we were able to explain everything that it does, you know, maybe it wouldn't be that much useful considering, for example, in a different context like self-driving cars. If you wanted to explain every detail of that algorithm, that wouldn't be probably an algorithm that you wanted to drive you around. So from our perspective, the requirements on, for example, approving credit applications should be much different from AI applications in uh, compliance monitoring, for example. So those contexts should be always kept in mind. Great. Thank you, Toka. Um, all right, so now um, we'd like to get into uh, some details of the AI machine learning risks, their challenges and potential mitigates. Uh, there's a lot of topics to be covered. Uh, as we just mentioned, it's very important for financial institutions to have a process in place for identifying and managing the potential risks associated with AI as they do for any processes, tools or model employed. Um, so some of the risks are associated with AI or machine learning are not unique to AI. Uh, for example, the traditional model risks still apply. Uh, the risk of third party tools still apply. Uh, on the other hand, AI machine learning uh, do present some particular or unique risk management challenges for financial institutions in the areas, for example, um, as mentioned, right, a model transparencies, explainabilities, uh, data usage, buyers, uh, fairness of machine learning models, and uh, uh, dynamic updating. So um, at, at this moment, uh, I'd like to uh, ask uh, or, or consult with uh, our panelists today. So what's your uh, experience, expertise, knowledge uh, about some of the risk areas uh, we just mentioned. Um, maybe, you know, some of the panelists just mentioned the model transparency and explainability, right? So uh, to my knowledge, it refers to uh, the, the extent to which AI decision process are reasonably understood and a bank personnel can explain the outcome. Uh, I, I'm aware of there's a lot of discussions in academia and industries about model explainabilities. Unfortunately, so far, there has no, um, you know, uh, well accepted or quantified measure of model explainabilities. So our question would be, uh, you know, why model explainabilities is so important uh, for financial institutions? Uh, how do financial institutions identify and manage the risk related to AI machine learning explainabilities? Yeah, so uh, I can I can start with that. Great. <clears throat> this is the right to the right uh, for an explanation. Uh, it's actually it's actually an ethical concern, right? Uh, we should be people ought to uh, receive an explanation for decisions that uh, can have you know, significant impact on their lives, right? And, um, and, and not providing that explanation uh, is, is an ethical concern, which, uh, you know, can also be linked uh, to risk as well, right? But um, transparency is more than just uh, explainability. Um, when we talk about transparency, we are talking about making sure that, uh, you know, the processes by which we uh, are assessing and mitigating AI risks uh, are, are understood by all the stakeholders within the organization. Um, you know, there is, there is uh, you know, the, the explainability 
part of the transparency, uh, you know, principle also applies within the organization as well, right? Uh, when we, when data scientists build models, uh, they have to think about how can these, uh, the outcomes of these models be explained to the, uh, the business user of that, of that model, right? And um, the explanation must be understandable to uh, to the specific stakeholder as well. The business user should be able to understand the explanation provided by the model. And then on the client, from the client's perspective, the client must also be able to understand the explanation that is provided by um, by the organization. Um, so the type of explanation has to be tailored to the stakeholder. Uh, but when we talk about transparency, I just want to emphasize the fact that it's more than just explainability. Uh, transparency is like this underlying principle that um, should cover um, anything that you do uh, with an AI system from the development of it all the way to the how it's being used, which is beyond just explainability. Yeah, let me let, let me also add some something to that. So yeah, I. I I do agree that explainability is, um, you know, it's an ethical concern, um, especially when you have, you know, client client facing um, models, whether they're directly client facing or indirectly. Um, in particular, I want to talk about explainability in the context of risk management applications of ML um, models. Um, so think about this particular use cases. So, for instance, when um, you build ML models to manage your portfolio, say a credit portfolio, for instance. Where you know it, you know, and that helps you adjudicate, or even if it's not adjudicating, um, meaning that it's not client client facing. Um, maybe you have a portfolio of credit cards or or any other kind of revolving facility where you're trying to figure out, um, you know, you're you're you're, you're trying to predict who has a higher likelihood to to default in the future, and you're and you're creating or recommending credit actions to the business based on that. Um, the idea is so the idea of responsibility is. You really want to understand the inner workings of your model, num number one, and that ties very closely with transparency, right? Number two, you also want to understand um, what are the risk drivers that drive the decisions made based on your model. And the more important question is how do they drive those decisions, right? Um, because the the way I usually explain, you know, when I when I when I hire um, data scientists for these kinds of um, problems is that um, a model failing and us not understanding why it failed could potentially mean, you know, um, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars of losses for a bank, right? Think about, and these might not even be client facing models, but think about the impact of that. So it's really important to, you know, and, and as, as these models get more complex, it's really important to understand um, you know, how how decisions are made based on the model and, you know, do, do sensitivity analysis, you know, um, stress, stress tests, and really, you know, be able to decouple those models and how they make decisions. And the, the one last thing I would say about this is um, this also impacts the way, or this should impact the way um, that, that the financial institutions hire data scientists. Because of the commercialization of machine learning, um, you know, every everyone on this panel would agree with me that we have um, a lot of data scientists in the industry that are really just technicians rather than um, data scientists. So, you know, they can they can import SQLN and they can build models, but they didn't really understand how these algorithms work. Um, when you're building very critical models like this um, to the balance sheet um, or, you know, income statement of a financial institution, um, you know, you really need data scientists who understand the inner workings and the math and the stats, you know, of how these ML algorithms work. Um, that is how that I think I think that is the first step um, in ensuring that we're building transparent models. And of course, um, OSFI and the Fed in the US um, really have to help us, honestly, um, in creating um, standards or even giving guidelines um, on how, um, you know, we should be looking at explainability. Um, not just looking for financial institutions to, to depend on the academic literature. Yeah. Maybe Thank I'll, you. Maybe I'll just add one thing on that topic. Uh, in terms of explainability, it's also important to 
what you are explaining and to whom you are explaining that. For example, you don't probably necessarily need to explain the inner workings of a model, but you would need to explain the input-output relationships and the sensitivity of the model, uh, just as Ed, Ed said, like you can, maybe you don't need to explain why someone got rejected having an income instead of like 1,000 versus 5,000 or where you draw that line, but it's an explainability issue if a model gives a completely different decision for someone who is making a thousand dollars versus someone who's making a thousand and one dollar. So uh, what is to be explained is also something that we need to, you know, identify. Yeah, I, I would, I would completely um, agree with you, Tonga, because there's just two things here, right? Two other terms uh, that we should talk about, which is justifiability mm -hmm. and reproducibility. Right, uh, and justifiability is is what there's a technical level of explanation, right? Which you know, if you're working with a neural network, like what hyperparameter had the greatest weight in making that decision? But really, that means nothing. It it it, it for for a model trainer, right? Um, it probably makes sense, right? And they can tune these to get to the right outcomes until they get the right outcome. But based on a stakeholder, if if a consumer comes and says, "Tell me why you made this decision." It doesn't matter what the technical details are. What matters is in that business context, can you justify why that decision was made based on the application? Mm -hmm. Let's take in this yeah. instance, it's, it's a credit score, right? So justifiability is big. Um, and so if we look, start looking at it from that perspective, we're gonna get less into the weeds of what type of explanation, explainability, what type of model, what type, like all the technical details, which is the weeds in which we sort of get lost in the conversation about explainability, but rather in the end outcome, which is justifying why that model is doing what it's doing in that business case. And then second is traceability, if the, or reproducibility, if a similar application came in, does the model make the same decision, right? And if we can show that it did, and there's a consistency to what it's doing, then you get further trust in the models. Ultimately, this is all about building trust in these models. That's why we want to explain them, but really we just, we need to ensure as these models more, gets more, get more complex, it's gonna be hard to explain. We need to be able to justify what they do. Mm. Love it. Yeah, that's a great point of view. Um, and I guess, you know, um, you know People talk about model uh, applicabilities a lot. Um, you know, the advantage of uh, AI machine learning tools is, you know, its accuracy, right? You know, it's a massive usage of the data uh, and applicability is, is considered a potential weakness, right? So the balance between the model applicabilities and its pursuit of high accuracy is always, you know, kind of uh, controversial and some, some, some balance need to be found. Uh, thank you uh, for all the um, inputs on this subject. Uh, another aspect of AI machine learning uh, usage is about, you know, the potential bias uh, and unfairness that AI machine learning tools may introduce uh, either unintentionally or systematically, um, you know, that the, some kind of a bias may be embedded in the algorithm without a notice. Uh, can, um, you know, uh, any of the panelists talk about, you know, the bias and the fairness issues in the AI machine learning and how can we mitigate such potential risks for financial institutions? I would like to start with that, if that is okay, with, uh, uh, with a real uh, example that we had in, in another country, not in North America, but... Um, now, when you think of the bias, and especially when you're applying AI in the regulatory domain, uh, there are some biases that unfortunately needs to go into the model. Like for example, the um, location. If a district is, uh, a branch is close to the uh, country border, then it is of course more likely to be uh, more prone to smuggling operations so that location needs to go into the ai but you have to be you have to make sure that it is not actually limiting people 
getting the banking services when they live close to the border. But for example, it's a double-edged sword. Like uh, in one case, we've seen that uh, many years ago, there were actually, let's say, uh, some immigrants to a country, you know, but a very small number of immigrants were involved in a crime gang. And then they were labeled by AI with respect to, you know, detecting them within the clients more effectively. But years, years passed and, you know, the geography changed and that country took a lot of immigrants from that country. And, you know, hundreds of thousands of people moved into that country. Now, the same model need to be updated because now it was limiting the access of those uh, immigrants to the banking service. So it wasn't something that was like providing bias five years ago, but now the model started, you know, uh, having a bad bias for people trying to access to the system. So I guess, again, it is actually important to see the bias in terms of the aim of the AI model, as well as the uh, current happenings around the region. So one should check multiple angles there. Yeah, I can. Uh, I can. Uh, I can continue with what Tolga said. So first of all, fairness and bias is probably the most complicated uh, among all the. Uh, you know, principles and, and risks associated with AI, right? Because uh, it, it's so, it has like very social, like deep social uh, implications, right? Uh, which which is, which as technologists and as data scientists, we're not really well equipped, right? We need we need a lot of external, you know, consultation, uh, maybe from ethicists or you know from from regulations and legislations, hopefully. But uh, all that being said. Uh, you know, when you, when you think about fairness and bias, you got to think about it first at the use case level and the outcomes uh, which are possible uh, for that use case, right? Because it's impossible to guarantee uh, fairness across all possible outcomes, right? Uh, so you might want to, you know, narrow your scope uh, with what you want to do with respect to fairness. Narrow the narrow the scope down to maybe you know uh, sig one or two outcomes that are most significant in terms of uh, what harm they might have, uh, they might create on a specific stakeholder, right? Um, uh, the, the harm that Tolga was talking about is, uh, is, is like a allocation of resources and opportunities harm, right? You're, you're not allocating resources and, and opportunities in a, uh, in a fair manner. And even defining what a fair manner is, is super complicated. That's why this whole you know, thing about fairness and bias is, extremely complicated uh, but you know long story short it's you cannot guarantee fairness for a, for a, for a model and for an AI use case you, all the best you can do is uh, you know identify a couple of few key outcomes focus your efforts on that and focus on the shortcomings right um, this is what we are not able to fix the, the this is the gap uh, this is the bias that still exists even though you know we did we you know, did our best effort, right? but it's it's more. It's like it's the toughest. Uh, it's the toughest principle uh, in trustworthy AI. I feel. Yeah, I, I just I just say that you know, models in general are built to be biased. Every prediction is a bias, right? I mean, that's what these systems are. They're trained to learn from data to make certain predictions um, and that's essentially bias. So bias in the technical sense is not a bad thing, right? So that's, uh, let's just point that out. Um, there's social, social harms or, or from a social technology con context, yes, there's, there's certain harms that, that, that we need to consider. And for Aditya's point, it is extremely complex. So I'll give a pr practical example. Right now in New York, um, and by the way, financial services, non-discriminatory practices are have been established in most of these, um, the, the risk management functions and compliance requirements. But now let's take the HR use case in, in New York. If there's an automated decision system used in HR, uh, it needs to go through a independent third-party validation. 
right? So the regulation has come out by January, 2023. Anyone hiring in New York using an automated system needs to have it assessed. The problem was as companies are going through this, what are the baseline metrics, right? Bias is subjective. It is use case dependent. It's geographic dependent. It's almost ethno dependent in certain centric in certain sort of ways, dependencies as well, right? Um, so when we look at that, it's they had to do another revision or they had to update the regulation halfway through to specify what they were looking for in terms of bias and fairness. So one challenge in this is if there are regulations, it it become it can become um, uh, if, it, if it's too broad, then you're lost, right? As as an implementer of systems, how do I know what I'm measuring against? What am I going to be held accountable to, right? And so defining that is going to be important. And as Aditya pointed out, it's one of the most difficult things because um, today it could be on let's say race based, right? So so the demographics need to be represented, minorities need to be represented. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you use something called like four fifths rule, right? So if you're you know, from the general population, if you're if within the certain demographic, your selection criteria matches the general population, four fifths rule, you're fine. But who picks four fifths rule? That's not the only metric. There's about seven other metrics or at least that you could use to measure fairness. So what are, and are we comparing apples to apples when one system is being compared to another? This is another challenge, right? It's I can use a certain different metric and slightly get away with perhaps a, a different outcome just because I use a different metric to measure. Uh, and I think those are, those are some of the challenges here and fairness and bias is also constantly changing, right? So what, what our, our opinions are of what needs to happen evolves as society evolves, right? And as we understand more. Um, so that's, that's another issue, it's, it's dynamic. Uh, and it needs to, you know, and to keep up with that is going to be a challenge as well. So it is one. That, these are many of the reasons why it's one of the most difficult things to do. Not that we shouldn't be doing it, but um, it presents its challenges, and we need to come to some common understanding. And when regulations come out, this is the point here. They need to be specific to begin with. And you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't on top of that. Um, I think Austria is going to have a very difficult job um, in, um, you know, providing guidelines and. And I'll use an example, right? So when we think about protected class variables, we think about race, we think about age. I'll use age as, as, as an example. So um, with, you know, if, if, if I were building, um, you know, uh, a credit model or a fraud model, for instance, um, someone could argue that, well, um, my, my model shouldn't discriminate based on age. But if I were building, that in, uh, you know, um, a health insurance underwriting model, or a life insurance on the writing model. Um, as a business, would it be fair to me as an insurance business to say, well, I shouldn't use age to, um, to you know, as, 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 as a factor on my underwriting model? Um, I don't think so. So when you move from one use case to another, or from one business to another, even within financial um, services, how do you really, um, you know, come up with a set of, you know, um, variables or a set of features um, you know, that, that you can really um, tell firms that, you know what, um, as a guiding principle, your models um, should not be discriminating based on these variables. And that's just an example of another, um, you know, another complication when it comes to the topic of, um, you know, biasness and fairness. Yeah, and uh, I'd like to add that, um, you know, uh, that's why transparency is so important with uh, for fairness, right? Uh, Transparency and fairness kind of go hand in hand because when you're dealing with such a complex topic as fairness, uh, all you, you have to be transparent with what you what you can try to do and what you're trying to achieve, and also be transparent with what you haven't achieved and what are the gaps, right? Um, it, you you got to do your due diligence and you know put your best effort uh, uh, with respect to fairness, but you got to be transparent, like. Uh, there's, there's still there's still this gap with these outcomes and um, you know maybe this maybe we've done all the best we can with respect to technical bias mitigation but maybe we can put some procedures and we can have like procedural mitigation steps right maybe a human review or you know some other kind of uh, you know downstream process that uh, can reduce the probability of an unfair outcome right in the end 
when you talk about risk, it's a, it's a mix of a, a severity of an outcome times the uh, probability, right? So maybe this is, you, can, yeah. you can put some mitigation step to reduce the probability um, that is not technical in nature, but procedural in nature. Um, so this is one of my favorite topics actually that you bring up, which is sort of the human in the loop con concept, right? Like where an outcome or a decision by a system is reviewed by, by a human, but I'll bring a perfect example that's happened in Canada, right? So um, last year, there was a news report saying the, the immigration algorithm from, um, that was used to uh, process, um, uh, I think it was student visas or visit visas, or so, some sort of visa, uh, and was found to be discriminatory uh, against a certain country, and I think it was from the Southeast Asia, it could have been India, but um, but essentially it was it was it was unfairly rejecting applications. Now, the thing was, it was not the system. The system was put in place, but a but an agent was supposed to review the application and um, pass it through. So it would have gone through a process, uh, like you mentioned, Adhya, but it's not as easy as that because the agents have an incentive. Their incentive is to process as many applications as possible within a certain period of time, right? So the the the, the human fails to provide the adjudication in the loop because their incentive structure is different from what the, the model is supposed to do. And, and so you miss you could end up missing things as well, right? And that's just the that question that um, that I think was I believe was asked, right? Uh, price and fairness may not align with org strategy or shareholder interest versus what a data science is supposed to do, the way it has been solved procedurally or the, what we've seen work well is, is through a procedure. At the very start, you define what the organization's uh, objectives are and translate that into design principles for the model that then the data science scientist takes to then implement and ensure that their model conforms to those or, or achieves those, those, those metrics. So it's not either or, it's, it's a, two-sided thing, um, uh, but at, at the end of the day, uh, procedures can only take you so far until the right incentives are put in place as well. One thing I just want to quickly add on on that is I think what we've seen, <clears throat> a lot of problems was due to the fact that the machines, which does the machine learning, do not live in the same world we are and they, they cannot differentiate between correlation and causality. So, uh, for example, if you fed, you know, just simple data into the model, like 40, 45% of all American senators are blue-eyed. Like, but we all know that it's just correlation and the causality behind the election and that would be something else manipulating both outcomes, but uh, the machines do not know that. So human in the loop is in particularly important to see. And one quick check, you know, we do and people can do uh, in that sense is uh, checking the distribution of population and features in the input stream and the output stream. It might be just by coincidence that certain feature, which does not affect the model that much, could be very focused and biased in the output. And that could have a potential to add bias to the model, not necessarily at this point, but you know, throughout the life cycle. So um, like human in the loop providing that sense of humanity sometimes uh, could be very beneficial. Yeah. Yeah, these are great discussions on you know, um, bias and fairness in machine learning models. Uh, as we know, models is an approximation to the real world, right? Uh, as they say, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So uh, bias is kind of uh, inevitable uh, in the model development, uh, but it's so critical to have a sound uh, model risk management framework control process uh, to, you know, identify and monitor such risks. Uh, before we move forward, uh, you know, for the interest of time, we just want to remind the audience uh, in this panel discussion, uh, we do have a QA session uh, by end of this uh, uh, webinar in the last five to 10 minutes. So feel free to uh, chat your questions uh, and send the questions to us. So we'll uh, turn to them a bit later. So, um, you know, uh, I guess uh, we have a few minutes to discuss one more topic today. 
um, we'd like to address some risks uh, brought up by the third party uh, or vendor. So what is the role of the third party along with uh, model risk management life cycles related to uh, AI and machine learning usage? Uh, what are the, some challenges uh, you know, in the in using the third party tools and the risk mitigate strategies that can be used? Um, we can imagine those risks and challenges may vary uh, by financial institution the size on complexities. Uh, can any of the panelists provide your uh, experience or point of views on the third party risks? Yeah, so I have a little bit of experience, um, you know, with model validation of, of, um, of some third, third party vendor models. I think the, one of the major risks that we face is the fact that, you know, traditionally model validation and model risk management in general has relied on um, being able to understand, um, you know, how the particular model works, right? Understand the methodology, um, you know, um, and being able to replicate it um, because that's that's how you can uh, provide, you know, effective challenge as it comes to conceptual soundness. Because a lot of people talk about, you know, um, measuring the performance of the machine learning model. Um, but, you know, experience will teach you that um, sometimes, um, model performance metrics are circumstantial, right? And a smart data scientist could always gain um, a model and come up with a good performance, right? Um, but what traditional model validation, at least good sound model validation has relied on is effective challenge in the area of conceptual soundness. Now, when you have a third party model, in order for you to be able to, uh, you know, conduct a good conceptual soundness check, you need to understand the methodology. Now, the problem though is that a third party, most third party vendors will tell you that, a lot of that information you're asking for is proprietary knowledge, right? I've I've worked with a few third-party vendors that are actually pretty great at providing um, all of the documentation that you need to provide to to actually conduct such model validation. But a lot of the newer ones and that are using, you know, what they would call state-of-the-art machine learning techniques would not provide you that. And so, as a financial institution, what do you do? Um, some of the some of the ways that you know um, I've seen. Um, some, some of the risk mitigants that I've seen is, you know, um, extensive outcomes analysis. So not just depending on the performance that, so, so, so not, just, not just depending on, on model performance metrics, but outcomes analysis. So actually look at the outputs that you're getting from the model, um, look at the distributions, look at the stability of those outputs with time, right? Um, look at, you know, um, their sensitivity, you know, de depending on the use case, right? You might want to look at their cyclicality. Um, it, you know, just outcomes analysis really um, infer what the model is doing based on your analysis of the outcome in relation in in relation to the input of the model. Um, one one more thing in the interest of time that I would say that has really worked is um, financial institutions cannot afford to depend on the um, model performance metrics that are reported by the third party vendors. Um, it's a good risk mitigant here for the, you know, FI to actually, you know, um, conduct their own performance um, assessment and also monitor these models um, very frequently, even after um, it's gone into production. So these are these are some of the risks and mitigants that I've that I've experienced. Yeah, those are those are excellent points uh, that you brought up. Um... You know, the, that's why like this whole field of uh, black box auditing uh, is, is becoming extremely important, right? Uh, if you think of a vendor model as like a black box, black box where you don't know the, how the model works, you don't know the internals of it, uh, you can, there's still ways which, with, with which you can poke this box and, you know, uh, analyze the outcomes, like you mentioned. And, um, you know, for on the fairness side, you know, there's like post-processing, you know, uh, analysis right post-processing bias mitigation that you could even do if you don't like if you if you suspect the outcomes are not uh, fair right um, you can and on the explainability side there is also you know uh, post hoc methods that you could use to try to explain the outcomes uh, of this black box so I mean it's not ideal I mean but you know Monitoring monitoring is important. That you mentioned, like like you mentioned, black box auditing is another way. And uh, in general, like 
try to get as much as you can from the and from the vendor in terms of uh you know documentation and how the model was created the decision making rather than you know the algorithm itself uh, i think you know a combination of those could help yeah two, two other things that we very quickly two things that uh, i'm seeing practically right now uh, like the new york law an independent assessment by an assessor um so just like you have i believe the company's duck creek where you can get um them to come in and look at your code and and do an assessment saying how much open source like what's the code quality blah 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 they do those assessments that you can then use and provide as a report to your buyers so someone like Aditya or or uh, Ade would be able to consume that and right and get some trust in what's what's been done so there's a growing um field there and I can speak to it because that's something we do at, at Armila um the, the the second thing is um also uh, standards and certifications. So IEEE, for instance, right? And, and so you have um, ISO, IEEE, um, the Responsible AI Institute, there's a few of them that are coming out with stand, standard metrics for different use cases that you can get certified against. And so that then provides a stamp that, because if someone has looked at my model, yes, it's not you buyer because it's proprietary. However, we've been able to open up the black box to an uh, to, uh, independent verification, and here's the results. And if that's trustworthy, then that's another way to um, you know to be able to gain um, to use that word again trust in third party systems. Thank you, um, thank you very much. Just be mindful of the uh, time uh, we have left here. Uh, you know, we'd like to turn to a few questions from the audience. Uh, the first question is about buyers and fairness. Uh, the question is, buyers and fairness might not be always aligned with um, organization strategies as shareholders' uh, interests are not always in sync with stakeholders' interests. Do we think that reducing buyers should be the organization uh, responsibilities or data scientists? I think Karthik... Uh answered this question uh, when, he, when he was talking about uh, fairness. Yes. I, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, Karate, but you did mention like it's uh, it's the responsibility of, of everyone, right? And within, not just the organization's responsibility, but also, you know, the, the data scientist's responsibility from a technical perspective. Um, yeah, but you can continue if you... Yeah. No, that's right. I mean, there's not, there's not much more to it than that. I mean, the organization sets what their objectives are as an organization, right? What you want to pursue and um, uh, what your principles and policies are. And if we can translate that to data scientists, then they can execute on that while they're building the model. So it's not, uh, there, there's a tactical level, like making ensuring the systems do that. But then there's a policy level and a procedural level where the organization sets, this is how we're going to behave and what we care about and, and how we want to execute on that. Thank you. Um, the next question, uh, which, you know, which is also being discussed a little bit, but the question is, as AI machine learning models building become more uh, democratic, uh, DIY tools enable business users or experiments to build, uh, how are organizations governing these AI machine learning developments before they are used for strategic decisions? I think these are questions about, you know, uh, any uh, model governance framework around the model development for AI machine learning uh, before the models become production in production or go live. Um, if you want to, please go ahead. Oh, I can go after you, Karthik, if you want. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, from my experience, like more, a lot of the organizations that we work with um, have are still figuring this out, right? So um, governance, there's teams that have implemented governance within, if you take a large enterprise, there's teams who have put these in place. Um, at an organization or enterprise-wide level, it's still being discussed how to how to do that. So there's governance at a, at a procedural level, again, to use as these terms, right? The, uh, how are we going to build, you know, what's the release cycle, what's the uh, pass-through cycle, what's the validation steps, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, there's a procedural aspect to it, and there's a tactical aspect to it, right? How do we test these systems? What does good look like? Who measures good? Um, 
and, and that, you know, what are the test results that we're looking for, et cetera, et cetera, certain accuracy metrics and performance metrics, robustness, explainability. So those are tactical, I would say. So there's, there's definitions that are still being worked out. Um, I think most companies are very early in, in putting anything that's, that's broad enough in place. And there's definitely a lot of conversation around it, but nothing I have seen that that's true. Yeah, when we when we think of uh, governance, we we actually think like at the very at the very beginning, why are we even building this AI system in the first place? Like, what business problem it's trying to solve? Uh, we, we actually start that early, right? Like, that, that's an important step. Like, is AI actually driving value to the business? Is it actually solving a business problem? And then you know, trying to uh, trying to assess you know what outcomes. Uh, might come out of the system and then, you know, trying to uh, identify and assess the risks and then, you know, mapping out, you know, these principles of trust. Uh, Anna Karthik mentioned trust me several times, but, you know, uh, what, like, what are the implications on fairness? What are the implications on explainability? What's the implications on, you know, reliability, which I, I guess you can uh, consider consistency and reproducibility and uh, as part of reliability, basically mapping out these principles of trust uh, to that particular use case, and then what actions um, and steps are required to, you know, make sure that the risks are within, or they, you know, the risks associated with, uh, within that for that use case are within an acceptable level. Um, and what, yes, it's, it's essentially, uh, you know, AI risk management is a big component of governance. But first, we have to think about why be building an AI system in the first place and have like a way to measure the value of AI. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just, uh, you know, for the interest of time, this is the moment we uh, we have to conclude. Uh, thank you uh, for all the, you know, the, all the panelists today uh, to give us very insightful um, and, you know, uh, their point of views on AI machine learning model usage for financial institutions. Uh, you know, I personally do enjoy uh, the discussion and the learn a lot from you. I hope the audience also have the same experience. Uh, we uh, look forward to any discussions on this topic, which that, you know, apparently is still involving and in development. Uh, thank you again uh, for the panelists as well as the audience uh, attending this uh, webinar today.